Welcome to Deloitte, Technology, Media, and Telecommunications Predictions for 2020. We're going to cover a number of topics today, but I want to start off with what I think is one of the most important, and that's in the area of telecommunications. I want to talk about 5G, to be more precise, private 5G. Now, you've probably never thought about this, but, but normal cellular is public. You pick up your phone in your own company's office, and the radio waves travel from your phone across public airwaves to a public antenna through a public switch before a reversing path and ending up on your colleague's phone in the same building, having traveled hundreds of meters or even kilometers over public domain in order to make a call inside your own office. What are the risks to privacy, to security, to resilience, right? Is there an alternative? There is. It's called private 5G. There are different models for private 5G. In Germany, for example, companies have spectrum set aside by the government between 3.6 and 3.7 gigahertz. That dedicated spectrum is available only to private companies and not to the telecom operators. What we're seeing in Germany is that companies across multiple industries, manufacturing, uh, aerospace, aviation, cars, uh, chemicals, are building their own private 5G networks. Not only their own spectrum, in some cases they're actually going out and buying the network equipment gear from the major players. This is a more complicated model and obviously some companies need to be pretty confident in order to be able to do that. Other companies are partnering with the network operators, uh, players like Deutsche Telekom. And in that case, the telecom company is the one setting up, building and maintaining the network. This private 5G network model that we're seeing in Germany is not the case in most of the world. In most countries, Spectrum has not been set aside for private 5G. In those cases, companies must work either with a local operator or that local operator needs to resell Spectrum to the company. This is what we're seeing, for example, in the Netherlands. There, the port of Rotterdam is working with KPN, the Dutch telephone company, in order to set up a private 5G network for the port. I think it's important to talk about things like ports, uh, airports, we're seeing that in France. There are a number of industries that are going to be using private 5G. Some of the early adopters I've mentioned already, things like factories, warehouses, ports, but there are others, uh, oil rigs, wind farms, uh, mines, mines are really, think about it. Think about a large open pit mine. There is no public 5G. Mining companies can build their own private network and do things like operate uh, trucks or even underground, operate in dangerous or unsafe environments remotely uh, piloted, taking advantage of 5G's extremely low latency to, uh, to move a truck underground. We expect the private 5G market to be worth uh, tens of billions of dollars by 2025. 2020 is earlier. There are, we've predicted there will be hundreds of pilots this year, but just as a little update, we said that back in launch in December. As of our tracking in the early part of March, already over 40 five private 5G pilots have been done, so it looks well on pace to exceed our expectations. Now, before I go any further on private 5G, I want to I focus a little bit on the advantages of, of, of this, because wh why bother with private rather than public? Probably the single biggest advantage is privacy and security. Um, fairly obviously, when you have your own equipment, you're in control of your own equipment, you can, you can restrict access, you can prevent cyber attacks, uh, your ability to control your own information is much higher. It's also more resilient. Uh, a, if the public network goes down and you have a private 5G, you continue operating in the event of a natural disaster or other network outage. It's cheaper. We don't know exactly how much. I'm estimating it's probably at least 20 to 50 percent cheaper to build a private 5G network over time. Uh, as an example, private enterprise voice networks called PBXs over time were 90 to 99 percent cheaper than public options. They also offer more features, uh, beam steering inside factories. There's lots of capability there. For all of these reasons, we are predicting that over time, private 5G networks will become ubiquitous. Before I move on, there are a couple of markets that I want to mention. Military and medical. 
uh, right now around the world, people who are wandering around middle, uh, military bases are carrying cellular phones with smartphones, wireless devices that emit a radio signal that gives away their device identification and their location in real time. This is not a secure way of doing things. I'm willing to stand here right now and predict that every military base around the world will have private 5G by 2030. The other interesting market to me is healthcare, hospitals. Uh, that's a real obvious one to me for private 5G. Yes, it's more private and secure, but here we are in the middle of the coronavirus outbreak. Think about moving people and machines from uh, uh, hospital room to hospital room. Can you just picture what running wires to all of these machines entails in terms of disinfection and trying to control the spread of a virus? Meanwhile, if you were using a wireless 5G network, you don't need to disinfect the radio waves. Uh, so I think that we're going to see uh, healthcare increasingly adopt wireless, 4G, 5G, and private 5G networks going forward. So that's probably our most important telecom trend. We're now going to shift gears a bit and talk about another technology, about AI. Now, when I'm discussing AI, I actually mean machine learning. Historically, machine learning was where you take a whole bunch of data and you gather the data, enormous amount, and then you train the system on that data, you produce an algorithm, and then you make predictions based on that algorithm, and that process is called inference. So it's training plus inference. Up until recently, all of that occurred in the data center. Why? Because the hardware that did machine learning, training, and inference was massive. These things weigh hundreds of kilograms, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and consume tens of thousands of watts. That's fine inside a data center, but you cannot put that kind of machine learning hardware at the edge of the network. You can't put it on a camera, you can't put it on a sensor or a robot or a light switch in the field. Therefore, all AI, all machine learning up until now, had to be done in the cloud over a network connection. What's changed? Edge AI chips. Now, I'm going to walk you through a virtual teardown of an Edge AI chip that you would find on a smartphone today. The Samsung S10 phone has in it a chip called the Exynos chip. It's the application processor modem. For the total Samsung phone, the bill of materials is about $420. But this one central processor, application processor modem, costs $70.50. And as you can see on this slide of the naked silicon of the Samsung chip, about 5% of it is, is not the, 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 the processor or the memory or the GPU that does the graphics. Instead, it's a dedicated portion of the chip called the NPU. An NPU is a neural processing unit. It's a small part of the chip, only about 5% millimeters square, using milliwatts and costing about three and a half dollars on the Samsung chip. There are other devices out there. Huawei has an NPU, the Apple A12 has an NPU, and the Apple A13 Bionic, the most recent chip found in the iPhone 11, it also has an NPU worth about three and a half dollars. What does an NPU do? As I said, it speeds up machine learning, but the critical part is it is, it is not like the chip in the data center. It's not that powerful. It doesn't use the, the, the chip for machine learning training, but it can use it for inference. Let me give you an example. As you can see on the screen, here's a picture of my wife Barbara that I took in the south of France last summer. Now, I'd like you to notice a few things about this picture. Look at the grain on the stone, the rust on the banister, the carving on the doorway behind Barbara. Look at the pattern on her dress, and if you've got a good monitor, maybe you can even see the straps on her red sandals. Well, none of that is all that impressive. I mean, phones are pretty good in 2020. But this photo wasn't taken in broad daylight, it was taken at 10.30 at night, and the sole source of illumination was a street light 20 meters away. To the naked eye, this picture was almost in complete darkness. So how does a phone, using the power of Edge AI, make this such a good picture? Simple. Very much like an old-fashioned camera, it held the lens open for one and a half, two seconds. But the problem is that I moved just a little bit. Barbara moved just a little bit. So the photo should have been very blurry. The reason it isn't is that the Edge AI processor on my phone subtracted my motion artifacts, making my image perfectly clear and still, and Barbara's motion artifacts, 
wait, this is where it gets good, producing a full color, high resolution, unblurred photo in real time. This didn't take minutes of processing, all without using a network connection. This is a feat of photographic computation that NASA would have had trouble doing 20 years ago with a supercomputer, and it comes for free on our phones today. Now that's a kind of consumery example. There are other chips out there. Uh, at CES in Las Vegas this year, a company named Sentient introduced their neural decision processor. It is one hundredth the size of the chip that would be on my phone and a millionth the size of a chip that you'd find in a data center, and it's not nearly as powerful. You can't, you can't do machine learning training and you can't take pictures of my wife. But you can have a wake word and maybe a short vocabulary of uh, maybe 30 or 40 words in any language you want. Why is that so interesting? Because picture uh, an oven, a light switch, a camera being voice operated and using microwatts of power on a tiny chip that doesn't cost $400,000. It doesn't cost $4. It doesn't even cost four cents. The power of these edge AI devices will be out there everywhere. The way to think about this is that everything that is done today becomes just a little bit smarter over the next few years. Deloitte prediction, 750 million edge AI chips selling in 2020, uh, 1.6 billion by 2024. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm just going to tell you right now. Based on what we've seen from companies like Sentient, based on what we've seen uh, from uh, uh, providers like Arm, uh, I think the number uh, that actually end up selling in 2024 won't be 1.6 billion. It's going to be 10.6 billion. The power of Edge AI is that you can provide machine learning inference on edge devices at low power, low cost, and low size. This is a global game changer. What would an example of that be? Think about robots. In this picture here, you can see there's two kinds of robots. Uh, the orange arm there is an industrial robot. Those have been around for years. But on the other hand, the little carts that you're seeing below, those are called professional service robots. Back in 2016, if we had talked about the robot market, it almost entirely would have been about the robot arms. They were 80% of the market back then. But in 2020, Deloitte is predicting that service robots, for the first time in history, will actually be the biggest part of the market, and at 30% growth, they're poised to double their size in the next few years. The important part of the robot market increasingly is professional services. Those are found in logistics, in warehouses, in manufacturing, uh, defense, inspection. They are an important and growing part of the robot industry, uh, and they are powered increasingly by edge AI chips and private 5G. Before I go any further, let's talk a little bit about those edge AI chips. You saw that little robot, that little cart running around. Historically, those little robots in warehouses, they had to follow lines on the floor or wires underneath the floor because they were dumb. They didn't know where they were going. If there was another robot or a human being in the way, or if you had to move something in the factory, they couldn't figure that out. Why? Because you can't put a $400,000 rack of AI chips on a little tiny service robot that's battery powered. But you can put three or four dollar chip and it is now just enough AI intelligence that that robot can now work beside other robots, maneuver in new parts of a factory, and even work directly beside human beings. Key point to make here, these robots are not replacing human beings, they are augmenting humans. Human beings are still the ones pulling those things off the shelves, placing them on the service robots who then take them to other human beings. Between a combination of private 5G Edge AI and service robots, we are looking at hundreds of billions of dollars changing the tech industry, the telecom industry, the manufacturing and distribution industries worldwide. We've spent a lot of time talking about technology so far. Let's shift gears and move to the media industry. First thing I want to talk about is AVOD. It's a new term for a lot of people. You all know what SVOD is, of course, that's obvious. SVOD is subscription video on demand, and that's a service like Netflix or Amazon Prime. And the deal is, the deal is, you give them their mo your money, and you get to watch video on demand, and there's no ads, right? And everybody, everybody hates ads. Or do they? 
Probably the fastest growing part of the video on demand market is not SVOD but AVOD, Advertiser Supported Video on Demand. Until recently, this has been largely an Asia Pacific phenomenon. In China and India, more than 2 billion people are already watching advertiser supported video on its video on demand with ads. And that market was 10 times larger than the SVOD market when you measure the number of users. But it's not just Asia Pacific, it is growing around the world. I just got back from Europe. Uh, lots and lots of broadcasters there are introducing AVOD channels and they're seeing some good success. The US market, AVOD is growing rapidly, uh, led by uh, services such as Hulu. Uh, lots and lots of growth, so much so that in fact, if we look at the global AVOD market, over over $30 billion this year, the North American part of AVOD is in fact the fastest growing in the world. A couple of reasons why. One of the things is that large, large providers like NBC are introducing an AVOD service called Peacock. Just to give you an idea, it has uh, three different tiers. Uh, the top tier uh, is premium content and no ads, and that costs you $10 a month. There's a, a tier with premium content and some ads, that costs $5 a month. And then there's another tier, and this is the one that really jumps out at me. It's, it's, it's $0 a month, and in case you didn't hear that correctly, I'll say it again, $0 a month, and you get to watch everything that's on NBC. And, you know, if willing, the 2020 Olympics happen, an example of that would be all of the 2020 Japan Tokyo Olympics will be available for video on demand uh, on your computer, on your laptop, on a podcast, not podcast, Chromecast to your uh, TV set. Um, there's going to be tens of millions of Americans watching this. Now, why do I keep talking about the U.S. so much and things like Peacock and AVOD in the States? It's about the dollars. When I look at an AVOD listener in India, the value, the economic value of a single AVOD user per year in India is about 84 cents. In China, it's higher. It's a little over $5 per year. But in the US, it's over $5 per month, over $60 per AVOD viewer per year in the US. So as AVOD takes off in North America and Western Europe, we expect to see this market really explode, not just in terms of billions of users, but billions of dollars. Similar to AVOD is Antenna TV. Many people are surprised by this. They think that antennas have gone away and will be getting rid of them soon. And that has happened in Switzerland, for example. They shut down terrestrial over the air TV. But around the world, that is not happening. Two billion people worldwide now watch some or all of their television using a terrestrial antenna. It is, in fact, the single most common way of watching TV around the world. The interesting thing about this is it's not just poorer countries. Sure, it's big in, in Indonesia and stuff like that, but it's also big in the US, in Italy, in Japan. Millions, tens of millions of people are still watching antenna TV. Uh, when we look across the world, it's, it's higher in some countries, uh, Greece, Italy, Spain, uh, fairly low in countries like Germany. Uh, Turkey is sort of in the middle, 20 some percent. But the ones that really interest me are the US, Canada, and the UK. Why? because the number of antenna TV viewers in those markets is growing uh, up a couple percent in the UK to 44 percent, uh, up 50 percent in the US to 13, and it's nearly doubled in Canada to 15 percent of viewers. So the fascinating thing that we're seeing with antenna TV is it's not your grandparents who have an old TV antenna who are watching it, it's young people. Our data shows that 18 to 34 year olds in North America are the most likely to be watching Antenna TV. That surprises a lot of people, so I'm going to walk you through it. Picture a 24, 25 year old. They've moved up, they live on their own. They, they don't want to pay, especially in the US, a lot of money for cable TV. It can be well over $100 a month. So here's what they do. They go out, this is tricky, they go to a store and they buy a digital antenna for $30 and they put it in a window, and if you live in a decent sized city, you get 25 to 35 high definition TV channels with local news, weather, and sports for free forever. You supplement that with AVOD and SVOD services, maybe a bit of Netflix here, maybe a bit of Disney Plus there, maybe some Peacock as well. And these young people, 18 to 34, are the leading demographic for antenna TV. Why does that matter so much? 
Broadcasters have assumed up until now that cord cutting, which is a real and growing trend, 5 million U.S. homes are expected in 2020 to cut the cord and cancel cable TV. Broadcasters have assumed that those people were gone, gone forever. Oh no, they're not watching TV anymore. If some of them, if half of them, uh, which is, seems to be about the number, are in fact putting up an antenna and still watching, the broadcaster is able to still show their shows to this 18 to 34 year old cord cutting demographic. The other bit of good news is not only are they still watching, they usually don't have set top boxes. So the really good news there is they're not ad skipping. People on cable frequently record shows and they skip over the ads. People who watch on antenna TV are able uh, to watch TV but are less likely to skip ads. Putting that all together, we are surprisingly optimistic for the TV ad industry, expecting TV ad revenues to grow 1% this year. That's not huge, but it's better than down 10. Our final media topic for this year is going to be about podcasting. We uh, continuously use our ears. We tend to neglect those markets. We talk about video a lot. But when we look at the podcast and the audiobook markets, those are growing at 20 to 30 percent. They are billions of dollars in value. And let's focus on the podcast numbers. Podcasting is very popular. Uh, in a survey we did in North America, 60% of 18 to 34 year olds listen to podcasts with half of them listening weekly or more. That translates to tens of millions of people in North America alone, hundreds of millions worldwide. The problem though with podcasting is that advertisers have not yet woken up to the value of these podcast listeners. I think that at some point that's going to change. When I look at people listening to podcasts, oh gosh, the demographics are good. These people are young, they're educated, and they're higher income. These are attractive demographics for advertisers, and I, I think that's what's supporting the growth in podcasting. But the other problem is the subscription model is, is not working well. In our same survey, we found that 90% of North Americans have never paid for a podcast. So that aspect of monetization is troubling. But I'm still, I'm still optimistic about the podcast space. At 1.1 billion this year and growing, I think it's, it's on a good path. One thing that I will point out is the enterprise market for podcasting. Companies around the world are using podcasts to educate employees, uh, to reach customers, uh, and to attract potential future new employees as a recruiting tool. So the enterprise podcast market, although not directly monetizable, almost certainly has additional billions of dollars of value. Our final three topics for predictions this year are kind of a grab bag across different industries. Let's start off by talking about low Earth orbit satellites. Unlike the geosynchronous satellites that hover over the equator 36,000 kilometers up, low Earth orbit satellites are much lower, only about 1,000 kilometers above us. There's a disadvantage to that. That means you need thousands or even tens of thousands of satellites. But the advantage is that since they're so close, the latency, the time it takes for the radio signals to go from Earth to the satellite and back are much lower. When using a geosynchronous satellite for data, the latency, the lag, can be 600, 700 milliseconds, maybe even a second or two. In low Earth orbit, it's much lower, milliseconds, 30, 40 milliseconds, very comparable to what you would get from uh, cellular data or landline data. As a result, multiple companies are launching satellites into low Earth orbit in 2020. We predict that there will be over 700 new LEOSATs, low Earth orbit satellites, by the end of the year, enough to begin providing partial service. There are multiple players in here, OneWeb, uh, Starlink from SpaceX, uh, Telesat, Kepler, uh, Amazon is trying to get into the space. There will be multiple players. The early leader at this point is Starlink. They have over 300 satellites up already. You may have even seen them zipping across the sky. Those aren't shooting stars, those are satellites. Now, what is the rationale for all this? Well, low Earth orbit satellites are enabled by a bunch of different factors. Uh, launch costs are down 80 to 90% in the last uh, 20 years. The new satellites they're making today are smaller, cheaper, more powerful. And there's also an increasing need for data around the world. Now, there's a common misunderstanding. Right now, about half the world, 47%, uh, of the world is connected to high-speed wireless internet, which makes you think, well, that means 53% aren't. That's the market these satellite folks are trying to reach. That's not it. 47% are connected. That's true. 
but another 43% of people actually live somewhere on Earth where mobile data is available, but those people either don't want the data or can't afford the data. Low Earth orbit satellites don't change that. That, what's called a usage gap, is not addressed by low Earth orbit satellites. What is, is the coverage gap. About 10% of the people around the world live somewhere where they can't get data. No matter how much they want it, no matter how much money they have, there is no data available for them. That's the market for low Earth orbit satellites. It's only 10% of the planet, but that's still 750 million people, not bad. But the problem is that, for now at least, the antenna you need, the antenna you need to pick up a signal and get data to and from these satellites, the ground station equipment is very expensive. I'm going to have to explain this to you. So I'm going to be a ground station. And I need to look, and as a satellite comes over the horizon, I have to pick it up, and with my dish, I actually have to track it in real time as it goes across the sky. And then just before it drops down below that horizon, I have to flip around in a tenth of a second and pick up the next satellite. You can see from the slide what that kind of antenna looks like today. And these don't cost $30 like a digital TV antenna. These cost five to $10,000. This is not going to be something that a goat herd on the side of a mountain is going to use so that he can watch videos. This is something for enterprises. This will be used by mining companies. This will be used by ships at sea, planes in the air, trains in the middle of nowhere, the military, uh, explore, exploration parties, people who have a budget of five to $10,000 for an antenna and don't mind spending hundreds or thousands of dollars a month for data. It's a really interesting enterprise market and it's one that we're going to watch. This is, by the way, real. There will be tens of thousands of satellites in orbit around the Earth within a few years. The next prediction I'm going to touch on really briefly is the smartphone ecosystem. About the smartphone themselves is about half a trillion dollars, just under. Uh, but there's other aspects to it. There's the services, there's gaming, there's uh, cloud, uh, there's all kinds of stuff. But one of the interesting ones is the smartphone accessory market. You know your earphones? Charger? Battery pack? Additional memory? Screen case? All of those together are a $77 billion a year market. The world's fourth biggest technology hardware market after smartphones, computers, and TVs is accessories. Believe it or not, all of our earphones and so forth at $77 billion are bigger than, wait for it, every single tablet, smart speaker, smart watch, VR, AR, added together plus $10 billion. So there's a lot of money in accessories. Our final prediction is around electric bikes, e-bikes. Not those scooters that you sit on that look like little mopeds, no. These are traditional looking bicycles, but with a battery and an electric motor. Now, you still have to pedal. Studies have shown that people with e-bikes actually burn more calories than people uh, with regular bikes because they ride further, faster, and more often. But it makes it easier. The hills get flatter. If it's hot weather, you don't sweat as much. Uh, it just becomes an easy thing to unplug from the wall, hop on, and ride to work. The Deloitte prediction is that the percentage of people around the world who take their bikes to work is going to double because of batteries. Why does that matter? Hey, electric cars are great, don't get me wrong. But we're looking at, by 2023, there's only going to be about 15 million fully electric vehicles in the world. And that's good, that's a start. It's better than nothing, but it's not really all that many if you think about it. In contrast, there will be over 200 million electric bikes around the world. Think about the power of all of those people getting on their bikes, riding to work, and getting out of cars, getting out of taxis, getting out of Ubers, making our transit less congested, making our roads less congested, making themselves healthier. Electric bikes are going to put a charge into our initiative to improve the environment.